Now, let me get back to this global net zero challenge. More like a delusion, if you ask me. I've shown you how even just in Australia we'll need a 1,000 wind farms like this one, then thousands of hectares of solar panels and tens of thousands of kilometres of transmission lines. Then there's switching all the world's road fleet to EVs and adding home batteries and large-scale batteries and all the rest of it. Australian academic Simon Michaud, based in Finland, has done the numbers on the minerals we need for all that. And, well, it's pretty much impossible. My calculation is very crude. Like it, it's very, very simple. But, but it illustrates a point that we have a, a dependency on minerals. And that has not been understood with any strategic planning so far. So at a, at a very senior level, it's being looked at all over Look, the world. The yeah, and the facts here are pretty stark. Uh, I notice, of course, that uh, when we assess the number of minerals that go into electric vehicles, for instance, that uh, there are six times more minerals required to manufacture an electric vehicle compared to an internal combustion vehicle. And then on top of that, we're looking at batteries at homes and we're looking at uh, engines and turbines for uh, wind turbines and solar plants and all the rest of it. And some of the numbers you've come up with suggest that uh, we need one billion tonnes of nickel. That's just one mineral, a billion tonnes of nickel, when in fact we only mine for two and a half million tonnes a year. So on, on your numbers, we need 400 years of mining to get enough nickel. I mean, this just means that it's impossible, doesn't it? Or is that too strong a word? No, uh, uh, the, the real the number I came up with was 970 million. So, yeah, a billion. All right. So you have to remember that the electric vehicles are, are dependent on metals that are we consider quite exotic. Like an ICE vehicle has mainly steel, aluminium, bit of magnesium, bit of copper, and that's it, right? Whereas an electric vehicle requires things like cobalt and lithium and manganese and, and all these metals that until now have been relatively boutique and exotic, uh, and but we need a lot of them. Like your electric vehicle is quite a bit heavier than your ICE vehicle, so to replace them one to one, uh, uh, we are talking about numbers like a billion tons of nickel, and that's just one metal. And so you, you can, for example, make batteries out of something else, but all the battery chemistries I've looked at all need nickel and copper and graphite. Um, so we've got a problem here. So 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 the outcome of the work is not. Uh, it isn't. We are not going to hit these mining targets. That's that's simple. And the out, simple outcome is we go back to the drawing board and we think of something else, something else that, and that something else has to incorporate the amount of minerals we need. Where are we going to get them from? And who's going to smelt and refine them into actual metals? And then who's going to manufacture them into goods? And in fact, that's the first bottleneck, the industrial value chain around manufacturing an EV, which happens not in Australia. It just seems incredible, really, that uh, not just a country like Australia, but many countries around the world are committed to this net zero pathway without even considering these practicalities, these physical constraints that mean in some, on some measures they just simply won't be able to do what they're promising to do. Now, when it comes to electricity supplies in the here and now, there are big shifts underway already in Europe. Uh, you're in Finland where about half of the electricity, as I understand it, comes from nuclear energy but sweden's going to go down that path now too countries in europe are going through the practicalities of looking at what they need to do uh now that they've actually legally committed to things uh they're, not, they're, they're looking at the practicalities and the idea of phasing out fossil fuels the way they thought they've now they found a whole series of things that are just not going to work and they're, they're facing the reality of, of it and there's a very since the ukraine war started up there is an internally a very difficult uh, internal conversation about which paradigm should go forward, especially in Germany, because all uh, all our models and predictions for the future haven't really worked out. They've, they've proven to be invalid. And um, so, so what do we do? How do we keep our industry going? Because the you know, th things, systems like wind and solar have their place, but we, we don't have them in a position at the moment that can actually support heavy industry. Uh, how, how do we do that? And uh, the simple answer to that is heavy industry is now leaving Europe uh, because their gas supply has been politically weaponized and they're going to the United States and they're going to China. And so what do we do? How do we do it? 
there is a there was a very frank realist conversation happening in the background whereas in the last 50 years it's been ideology what lessons should australia draw from europe that hopes and dreams are not good plans we should you know think things practically through what each region now has to do is we have to sort of decentralize our industrial system where it's all very focused on china and now we've got to break it up into each region now has to do everything itself so there are five levels of the industrial system there is mining there's refining and smelting of metals there's manufacturing of components there's manufacturing of finished goods and then there's recycling or waste handling all five has to be rebuilt in each region to be more self-sufficient right and so each na nation state each group around the world will have to do this they'll have to invest resources like they're investing in their military to actually build an industrial capability that is local and if they don't then they are beholden to an inelastic market that is going to be very difficult to navigate that's probably what the australians need to see now, now i've actually talked to a few uh, i was in australia at the world mining congress in in june and i was talking to uh, uh, government officials in the mining industry and they, they are well aware of the challenge that's in front of them they're still trying to get their arms around how to do it uh so, so conversations are being happening happening yeah lots of questions lots of problems not so many answers uh, on board just at the moment simon thanks so much for joining us okay pleasure